Fire, Paul Slack is a good news broadcast and cause the world for peace. And we have some real talent in the world of music and uh, good Samaritanship and doing nice things for a lot of people. We have uh, Darius Diesel Harrison. Uh, good morning, uh, Darius. How you doing? What's up, Paul? Happy belated birthday. Oh, man. See that? Yeah, what, a, what a nice guy. Donald, uh, th thank you very much. Donald uh, Donald Harrison? Why are you two guys made in trouble? I got two Harrisons here. Donald, how are you doing? Oh, Harrison is a match made in heaven, but... He, Hi, he, guys. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, guys. We're recording. Hey, Sandra. Sandra. Here's Sandra. Okay. Hi. Sorry. I'll be quiet. Go ahead. I may jump off, but I'll let you guys talk. It's a beautiful picture of you. That's Sandra, let me, I'll say, because she's on our board and she's been a friend for 20 plus, if not longer, maybe. You know, she's a, an A&R uh, account, a CBS. She, she knows the music business. Whenever I uh, whenever I play a G-sharp, uh, when I play a, a, an ins a song, my, so I'm a musician too, so that's why I'm a little nutty. Um, uh, no, she knows the industry and she's a heck of a PR person. And uh, it's an honor to know Sandra, Jim DeCosta. Thank you. So I'm going to get back to Donald. Uh, we, we're talking Harrison talk right now. Um, <laughs> well, uh, actually, Donald, what did you say about Harrison? It's it's a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to link up with. Uh, uh, he's called Diesel in the industry, but I know him as Darius Harrison, and uh, he's he beat me to the punch this time as he's been doing a lot lately, like saying happy birthday to you. So we want to get that in there. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> well, so let me, let me see here. I got everybody on now. So, so, uh, uh, who mentored who? I heard the word mentoring and, uh, uh and whoever mentored who are you, what, what's the feeling about that with you two, just you two directly? Well, I guess, I, so. I, I guess I started as the, uh, a mentor, because I was a lot older when I met uh, my Harrison uh, brother, and uh, I just saw so much talent in him that I decided to focus on really helping him uh, find his voice in the music with, with the lessons that I learned from playing with over 250 of uh, the greatest jazz masters and other forms of music, whatever I could help him. Uh, get get to the place he wanted to be with uh, the the teachings from those masters I tried to pass down to him, and uh, as as you know, history has uh, told us that he has done a great job in terms of uh, finding an incredible uh, legacy in hip hop and soul music, as well as jazz laced uh, hip hop and soul, and and now in the uh, what he calls Spanglish music uh, from the uh, modern Latin perspective. So, Donald, you, uh, I mean, you're, you're a big chief also. How come you got that name? What does a big chief mean? Well, that's an incredible story and one that uh, is very important because in New Orleans, there was a place in Congo Square where the uh, people of African descent, descent could gather and participate in their homeland culture. And they did it every Sunday in circles, little circles. And they also engaged with each other. And this uh, became one of the root contributors to, of course, New Orleans music, starting with jazz and some of the other forms that were down here, ragtime, and also the music of the world. So that little space in New Orleans where Africans were allowed to continue their culture, inform the music that came from here, which informed the music of the world. And uh, it was also a confluence of uh, all kinds of people from all over the world who came to see this remarkable spectacle that was taking place every Sunday in New Orleans. Uh, but nowadays there are tribes in New Orleans, still tribes carrying forth that music and that music still influences New Orleans music and music of the world. Tina Marie did a record called Congo Square, and other people have written songs about it. But oh, it's a, one of the greatest honors of my life 
to have gone through the rituals and uh, to come out as the big chief of Congo Square in these times. Congratulations to you. You know, I, 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 I started CBS 72. And uh, at CBS, uh, we used to hold um, the, the television uh, industry, what they call NAPTI, National Association of Television Producers. And uh, we used to hold it uh, in New Orleans. So that was my first time I got down there. I think I, I, mm. I, I, I literally, though, stayed in, the, in a, a, a home in, in down in, in, the, in, the, in the downtown part of the town, you know, not far from the Preservation Hall, um, in a slave house. They told me that in the back of the house was another house. And and I and I stayed there. And they said to me, "This is a this is a slave house. This was a slave house." So I mean, New Orleans has and has has a very interesting uh, uh, growth, I guess you would say, in in the world, right? I mean, you guys are are you were born there? Are you guys both from down that way? Yeah, we're, we're New Orleanians. Tied, yeah, tied, born and raised. Uh, I tested. <laughs> and and well and well preserved and lasted in it. Tell us a little bit about well, Donna, why don't you well give me give me a little bit about uh, you know you're mentioning musicians and uh, and I'm a I'm a I'm a sax and piano man and uh, some of the names if not all the names <laughs> of all the people you work with I've heard of. So the, tell us some of the people you played with and uh, and why you've had so much joy doing that. Well, I started with a great, in New York, I started with a great drummer by the name of Roy Haynes when I was 19. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I was really taken aback. I'm, a, I'm a, a student of Charlie Parker still to this day. But he uh, told me, Burge, you've been born again when he heard me and immediately hired me. So that, that was great. And he tried to spread the gospel of who I am. You know how great he is, but then I, I went with uh, Jack McDuff and Art Blakey and uh, Lena Horn, oh. Miles Davis, great hip hop group, uh, Diggable Planets, who, who used jazz, and uh, Guru, who had a band called Jazz Mataz. I was associated with them. Ron Carter, I mean, we, we could be here for a little while, but Fred, Fred, uh, Fred Wesley. From uh, the J.B. Horns, a little bit with Pee Wee Ellis from the J.B. Horns as well. So just just uh, musicians across the board, Eddie Palmieri, a uh, great Latin maestro, Latin yeah. music maestro. Just just uh, a lot of people across the board. And I'm always pinching myself on the bandstand that I look across and there's Miles Davis and I'm playing with him how something like that could happen to a little saxophone player from New Orleans. Who put the the reed in your mouth? Who put that who put that mouthpiece in your mouth? Who who are you 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 requested it or someone said, "Why don't you uh, take up an instrument?" Well, no, I I was not even thinking about a saxophone. My father who was an avid listener of music and also the big chief of five different groups in New Orleans. He was passing a music store in New Orleans called Whirlines Music, and he saw the uh, saxophone in the window, and he loved Charlie Parker. So th there's an irony of, of this. He got he purchased a horn and, and brought it home, but I didn't want to uh, play music at that point, so I played it a little bit and then put it in the closet until I heard Grover Washington's Mr. Magic. Then I took the horn out and learned Mr. Magic. And people started hiring me to play gigs soon after. So uh, I guess my father's premonition that I should have that alto saxophone and that I would wind up loving Charlie Parker because of him and understanding his depth was uh, well-founded. So I started playing the, just so, and I started playing the Charlie, you know, Charlie Parker and Grover Washington. I mean, I just started playing it. <laughs> so you're a natural, right? You're a, you're a natural. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm a natural. I just, uh, what, what, you know what I know? When I'm not doing something right. So right. it gives it gives me the chance to do it right. I, whatever I used to practice a lot when I was young, 
I would always say to myself, that doesn't sound like Charlie Parker if I played something. Uh -huh. So I, I would I would eliminate it and when when I uh when I found it sounded like my hero, I would I would put it in, in the uh into the file cabinet and have it there. So I have all of these things that are practiced by uh basically every era of jazz and all styles of other music which I have uh used to create uh a style of music called nouveau swing and now quantum improvisation with quantum theorist uh well i'll say published quantum theorist stefana alexander so i'm just happy to be here happy to collaborate with all the musicians across many styles of music and happy to show uh anything that i've learned to inquisitive and hard-working musicians uh happy to share that information and get and get new information from the younger people because I get information from uh, Darius Harris and Diesel to the people out there in the music world just because he's kept up with so many things as well. well he's a very accomplished and uh, he's very patient. And uh, I went with the big chief first. I hope you're okay with that, Darius. And I got to show my due, my respect. Of course. All right, got to. <laughs> and, uh, and that's that's what it's all about. Let me. I'm just going to ask uh, Donna one more thing and make sure I understand. So, so uh, Sandra uh, mentioned to me, and actually, uh, something I do myself, um, especially on the piano, because I'm not that good. But I could play the same song in every. I could play tequila in egg, any kind of. I'll play it classically. I could play the same song very many different ways. Now, aren't right. you doing something something like that? You are, but but re, more refined than my stupid tequila. Or no, or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is, is what are you doing? Because you're taking a piece of music and you're making it what a bossa nova. You're making it a a, a, cha, a cha, cha cha. You make a waltz. What are you, what are you doing? Well, you know, I, like I said, I had the opportunity to play with masters of many styles of music. So what I've done is to. Uh, put these things hopefully in the highest form poss possible from my experiences uh, and to diff take one song and put it into different uh, genres and then take all of those genres and mix them in into a new jazz style. But we have a recording out called uh, The Magic Touch and that song is in nine different genres. So when I play when I play the Latin version for the people from Cuba, one of the great Cuban musicians said it's a perfect song. When I play the the song for people in uh, in Jamaica, we did a reggae version. They say you really captured the spirit of roots reggae. When we play the second line version here in New Orleans, they uh, the people automatically know that's. So I wanted to be authentic to the people when they play the soul and smooth jazz on urban radio. You know, that tells you that it's it's in the pocket. And when we, uh, we're going to start doing, uh, trying to get the hip hop version played on radio, that's the version I worked on with Diesel. And we have a, a smooth jazz version with Chris Bodie on it. Just so many different styles. But the, the, the key factor was to be experienced enough in all those styles of music where I could have uh, the song for each genre be authentic and uh, true to what that music is. And that that's the part that's a lot of hard work. Most people are not gonna spend uh, almost 50 years playing with a lot of different bands and the uh what how hard, and not know how hard it is for those different uh artists who are really geniuses in those genres to consider hiring you and to teach you their lessons that's a very difficult thing for you know to to play in Eddie Palmieri's band and then to go play with Ron Carter the next week and then to go to play with Lena Horn and uh and then come to New Orleans and play with Dr. Michael White and they all say uh, you're you're at the top of the game, and that was my greatest reward. That these great geniuses uh, started calling me actually a genius, which I don't know what that means, but just that they loved 
my uh, need to be the best I could be in, in, in all those different music styles. What I what I love about that, and because I, I believe this is a, you're not pushing what they call like well, let's say a rolling button. You're not pushing the buttons, right? You're 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 writing that music down. You're 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 doing music. You're not doing button pushing. Is am, am I right here? Because you can, all these different genres they seem to have, and I don't. I'm not an electric. I have one of the things, but I don't like it. I I'm a, I need a, an instrument. You can push these buttons nowadays, right? And take that to to kill the song and make it into fifty different things by pushing buttons. Isn't that right? Something like that. Oh yeah, but I mean, in certain in certain forms of music, you could probably do that, but you can't make a an acoustic jazz song with, uh, and push buttons. So it, it's just, but there's it depends on the person pushing the buttons, because some things, some things, some music is pre. Pre, uh, uh, hello. Some some forms of music are prepackaged and sent to artists, and they can sing on top of it, and then somebody can pre uh, redo their vocals until it sounds like something. But no, uh, everybody that I'm involved with, they're actual musicians, right? So the so the music uh, reflects that. Even if we're if we're doing what you call push buttons, then it's still is uh, music that we thought of, and we uh, is a uh, new new uh, sounds that uh, we uh, actually work to get. I'm not fully hip on electronic music. I'm not fully hip on uh, robot music, and I'm not. I'm questioning what AI was going to do. Okay, I'm old time oh. music. Oh, uh, how are we going to make this happen? You know, <laughs> let me give Darius. He's been here very patiently, and he's, let me he's, respond to that about the, we, the robot. Okay. Uh, you know, there's going to be some people who love it. It's anytime somebody does something new, and there's going to be something. Some people who hate it, and there's some, going to be some people who are sitting on the fence. But music, I always say, this the analogy of music and food gets you to understand. Some people like uh, spaghetti. Some people don't. It's just they don't like it. So it's okay not to. You have you have uh, the right and the freedom to choose what you want to choose yes. music and you also have the, the right to freedom <laughs> and the right and the freedom to think uh one person may not know more than than, than another but i can tell you i've been in the studio with uh, darius and we put we're putting music together from an electronic standpoint and we're both uh using every ounce of uh, what we know about music to put those songs together okay so uh, and the orchestration for for that, the the other styles of music, if they're done by a human being, it's just as much work as uh, writing a song that you might uh, play with with a bunch of beboppers. It's just a lot of work, and uh, the the result of working a lot and trying to understand a lot of things will manifest in whatever genre you're playing in. But I, I I can't speak on AI. That's another thing that but that doesn't really need a human interference in some cases. But I'm quite sure there's some cases where you may generate something by AI and then put the hum, humanity in it with the real human beings. So every song and every idea has a million ways to look at it, a million different viewpoints. And we, we have to, uh, you might enjoy playing with an AI with a jazz band. Or, or with an R and B or soul band, or in a classical state, you know. And and one thing I forgot to say, with the with the songs that I'm playing, there's also uh, an influence from uh, quantum physics, because I've been working on quantum improvisation uh, with a with a published uh, quantum theorist, uh, and he uh, and I have found things. That if we weren't dealing dealing with it from that perspective, it, it would never have been found. I don't think, because of the, we turn two dimensional music into four dimensional music. We use the Minkowski uh, quantum space uh, diagram and formula to come up with with uh, a new concept 
for how how uh, time and and it, how it's portrayed in music. So we're, we're using the slit experiment for another uh, kind of musical uh, paradigm. So so all of these things. Someone in, initially when I told musicians about me working with quantum uh, principles in music. They thought it was a joke, but now everybody's calling me, asking me how uh, we put that together. So everything can be a possibility. Something you think you don't like, if someone presents it in a fashion where it's uh, closer to your views, then you say, oh, actually, I like it. So we have to leave ourselves open. I have just decided that you are my mentor. Awesome. <laughs> well, I've made the decision. If you'll take me, if you allow yeah. me, you is one smart dude. I did, I did the, uh, I did the brain series. I've been making shows a long time, and uh, you got some brain inside that head because you know, like I, in the brain series, we opened one of the shows with a guy named Michael Tilson Thomas. He's the the leader of the orchestra up there in San Francisco, and you know, he said, "I don't need a piano to play the piano. It's it's really." Right, it's up here. The your your mind uh, open or closed to the world around you, right? Even when we talk, it's, you can say it's music, right? I mean, you know, hi, that's a sound. That's, that's uh, you know. But you you didn't go. Did you go to school? Did you study music? Did you go through all that stuff too? I'm sorry, uh, Darius. I hope you don't mind. This guy's a wealth of knowledge. I didn't realize what the heck um, she's getting me. No, nah, no need to no need to apologize. When she got me into that son. No need to apologize. This guy's got it. Uh, got it going here. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I'm just a uh, person that loves a lot of things. But you know, one of the, speaking on what you just said about music is everywhere. That was one of the first lessons as a teenager I got from Roy Haynes, that to see music in all everything that you do, because life life informs the music. Basically, you are the music that you play. Is a representation of your life, so you you can't get away from that. Charlie Parker said, "If you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn." Which is, and he also said, "There's no boundary line to art." Uh, so the so you, those two things will help you to understand uh, how he became such a genius. Both of those gentlemen, uh, Charlie Parker, greatest uh, contribution was that he listened to everything. Even things people put him down because at the time when he was playing the blues, it was a put down to say you were a blues artist because it was thought of as the same kind of music as hip hop by the upper crust uh, musicians. Hip hop? That's true. Yeah. No, no, it was thought, the blues was thought of as a, a lesser form of music. They would put him down for, for adding the blues to what he was doing. And they, he actually did a, a recording of Jive Talk, which was a precursor of hip hop with a and he's and he's doing jive talk. So it would be the equivalent of Charlie Parker rapping rapping on a record in these times. <laughs> but everything Charlie Parker heard, he put into the music. And that's the ideal. You know, he was quoting uh Stravinsky while he was playing with Stravinsky at the table. He studied Stravinsky. So you can hear all those things that he studied, but he also studied the blues and he also dealt with jive talk. So he was what I call an inclusive musician. And, and my definition of an inclusive musician. Oh, something went, something happened with your sound. <laughs> oh, you muted D. Darius, let's uh well oh now make him come back. There yeah. Is. Okay. Yeah. Again. I'm gonna finish that thought and then then we can toss it to Darius. That thought was uh can't hear you again. Oh you muted again, D. <sighs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, something, some, some, someone keeps trying to call me. I'm on my phone, but anyway, I, I'm going to com complete the thought uh, about Charlie, 
Charlie Parker became an innovative because he was an inclusive musician. And uh, from what I understand, when you include all, you come up with a different formula than the guy who just stays with one plus one equals two. It's always going to be the same result. John Coltrane was an inclusive musician because he uh, used his life in, in, in the world and what he understood of music and a lot of different things to create a brand new sound. And so was Miles Davis. So was uh, Duke Ellington. So was uh, a person like Sidney Bechet. So oh, I know more. music, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, I love this whole conversation. I'm a, I'm a jazz guy since I was a little boy. So uh, all this kind of, you, you, may, you make me out of my mind here, right? Now, I ran a jazz festival. I talked to Mobile, Alabama one time. Wow. Ran the jazz, Quinnipiac College Intercollegiate Jazz Festival. It was the largest college. So all the, I was going to go work for Downbeat. But all, I love what you were telling me because it, it's actually, it's the real guts of... Uh, of of uh, success, even when I talked to T. S. Monk and uh, and he talking about you know running around in the house with the boys running all over there and talk, but you're you're, I tell people when they're playing the jazz, play Mary had a little lamp. I mean, do something you know, play you know as you're saying you know, enjoy. Do Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, right in right in your little tequila. Whatever it is, people go crazy. They love it, and I can see that Darius does that. He got Grammys. He he's he's telling all those uh, young hip hop artists and singers and entertainers to be probably because he heard it from you. I'm telling you, someone's got to hear it from you because you really know how to sum it up. From what I'm hearing right here, right now, you know how to sum up music, and for somebody to become better, not to be st stuck on their own sound but to keep them ears open so they can hear everybody's and finger, figure, think whether that maybe might be even more entertaining. I, I gotta I gotta say to all this, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, it's, it's, it's just you have to follow your heart. Some people, you know, I don't know how they get to into their calling, but if, if a person uh, loves Charlie Parker and they wanna try to play just like him, which is an impossible feat, but they, they're cool. adding. They're they're adding something to the world because it's it's a it's an entity. Those people become an entity, and a, and and their voice is necessary too. Even if they're uh, just repli trying to replicate something else, because they're keeping that sound alive. So we have to learn how to respect everybody for uh, how they how they want to play, and then whether you like it or not, that's that's that call is on you. Because we all have a, a right not to like something. Better, we all got.